last year, last June, just, um, just almost 365 days ago, uh, I went to Chico, California, um, some three hours from Palo Alto, and I think of Chico as a kind of dry and dusty place, but there in Chico, maybe some of you know, is a place called Bidwell Park, which is a very secluded, um, beautiful space. This is a photograph I took that day in Bidwell Park in Chico, and I wasn't there just alone. I was there uh, with my younger daughter, Anna, who was uh, 13 at the time. She's here with her sister, Lucy, and it was, needless to say, uh, a moment of communing between father and daughter and communing in a specifically quiet place, a place um, where the sun comes down onto this not just any kind of creek, but some beautiful creek, almost the epitome of all creeks, clear running water, about 20 feet wide, 20 inches deep, um, with just the rill of the stream sounding in our ears. We're secluded, cut off from the rest of the world, and it's a kind of moment I've learned to appreciate a lot in my life, um, to seek these moments out, if they will consent to seek me out, because it's always kind of magical and metaphysical, but suffice it to say that time stops. Uh, there's a kind of calm. It's born also of love between a father and a daughter, absolutely. And it's not just the stream, but really anything, the branches overhead, the individual poor, impoverished leaves that we might not think to honor or celebrate or see uh, become somehow a part of this electrical atmosphere of calm. And it is, to put it another way, a kind of moment of the present tense. I think we use this phrase, live in the moment, and so on, and I probably every single person in this room can give credence to that as a ph philosophy, but I, we could probably also say it's hard to do uh, because it involves, a cert for me at least, a certain kind of passivity and calm. Um, uh, you know, turning off one's phone is only the first step in the task. Uh, it involves a kind of surrender so that in receiving one can give. So the present tense, but there we were in Chico in Bidwell Park and we were also communing with the past because father and daughter were there really also to be at the spot where in the year 1937, a bunch of Hollywood people came up, including Errol Flynn, to film the Sherwood Forest scenes in the 1938 Technicolor epic, The Adventures of Robin Hood, there in Chico. And we wanted to be there where this film, these scenes in this film had been made. There is Flynn, um, uh, about whom it was certainly accurately said by one of his friends that you could always count on him he would always let you down. Uh, <laughs> but he's truly marvelous in, in this film. Um, that's Alan Hale to the right as Little John. And um, you know some of these scenes you will recall, perhaps if you've seen it, there's a, a famous scene where Little John and Robin Hood meeting on this downed tree. Um, you know, come to odds and it's may the best man win, but they become friends. Um, it's right there on that creek where we were. There's also a scene where Robin Hood fights Friar Tuck, who he's also just met in Chico, California at Bidwell Park, i.e. Sherwood Forest. And then there is another scene also filmed in Chico where uh, the merry men climb into one of the very oak trees that we were beneath there in that park, and they're doing so to lay an ambush on um, the unsuspecting Guy of Gisborne, played by Basil Rathbone on the right, better known sometimes as uh, Sherlock Holmes in various films from that time. And on the left, pride of Saratoga, California, Los Gatos High School, Olivia de Havilland playing Maid Marian. They, needless to say, are not suspecting anything will go wrong on this slide, but it's not long before they are captured, and then Olivia de Havilland gives the cold stare to Robin Hood, whose ways she does not understand. She thinks he's a common criminal. 
She um, is resentful and disputatious at this massive feast that they've made there, the merry men have, out of the stolen or taken rations of Guy of Gisborne. But uh, um, eventually she sees that he is a righteous individual. He is taking from the rich to give to the poor. And he even bestows a kiss on her willing hand. It's, it's lovely, yes. So, so as I track back to what I've said so far, there's the present tense and there's the past tense. And I, for, as someone who is a cultural historian, I deeply commune with the past as well. I feel that being precisely in the place where there is nothing at all, there is only the remainder, the vapor, the invisibility, of some event that once happened uh, is for me as rich and as electrifying as this experience of, of presentness. And in fact, all of my courses at Stanford really finally come down to pre presentness and pastness and the kind of rich um, uh, mixture, almost like an elixir of drink drinking of those two things. It's past and present, but it's also, I would say, truth and make-believe. Um, it's being at the spot where something real that never happened, happened. You know, there's a, nowadays, fairly enough, we distinguish between truth and falsehood as never before, but fiction sits beautifully between those categories. War and peace, it never, there, you know, there was no um, Natasha, you know. It's an invention, but it's true, we believe it. Fiction is not the same as falsehood. So being in a place that is truthful and fictional at the same time, suffice it to say, this is the kind of stuff of which we drank uh, there for no more than 15 or 20 minutes. And then I said to Anna, because it was the day before the Stanford graduation last year, I said, Anna, we just need to go back to our hotel because I do need to check my email because I am the chair of the department and I just have to click on some buttons to make sure that everyone's gonna graduate. <laughs> You know, just so an inglorious aspect of what I do, but I did. And when I went there and opened up my email, there was an email uh, from a party that I had never received an email from before called the U.S. Department of Justice. And it's dated there on the bottom left, June 15th, 2017. Um, and what this email is about is the murder of my brother who was killed in prison in the year 2014. Uh, he was beaten to death um, by uh, other inmates. And he was actually beaten to death by three successive waves of these inmates um, who perhaps didn't mean to kill him, but they put him into a coma and he was on life support for a while and he died as soon as they took him off life support. So immediately, as we look at a picture of my brother in his younger days, uh, he was two years younger than me. I was born in 1963, he was born in 1965, so we're talking about someone who died at age 48. Um, immediately, I put these things together somehow. The magical experience of present slash pastness with my daughter, and then the news that the first arrests had been made in uh, the, the death of my brother. And, Needless to say, it's a, it's a complicated kind of thing to hold all of those things in mind. If you look at my brother there who's sitting on some nameless beach, certainly not in Missouri where we grew up, maybe he's on spring break, uh, the very pose of the guy shows what a total playboy he was. Uh, not only did I never smoke, but I could never hold a cigarette like he does in his right hand, just kind of casually flicking off the ashes. He was everything I was not, he was outgoing. He was, dare I say it, popular, um, and that's what got him into trouble. The 1980s, you don't want to hear my 1980s lectures at Stanford, or maybe you do, because they're, they're, um, they're pretty righteous. Like, that's a, that's, a, that's a dark decade in American history. My brother got hooked on cocaine then. He never really got it together, and he, uh, in what's a kind of all too familiar story concerning Americans and drugs, he ultimately found himself in Leavenworth Prison in Kansas, and uh, 
he met some very bad people, um, and he was, he was killed there. So I'm thinking about all of this, and immediately I thought back there in the hotel to two things I had seen, we both had seen there in Bidwell Park, which I noted at the time, but I felt were uh, now took on extra significance. One is the fact, you see this netting here, this yellow netting, is that we were actually trespassing when we had our you know, blissful communing with the world experience. We really didn't pay much attention. The, the yellow netting or fence, if you like, was already down, so we simply walked past it. But somehow the idea of trespass popped into my mind, but so too did a little, I don't know if you'd call it a still life that we saw there and that had been left as though for us. Um, it consisted there on the ground by the bank, so if this is the stream, the, what you're looking at here, which is a hooded sweatshirt, mostly was right here. And we're talking about a hooded sweatshirt pinned down to the ground with rocks, the arms upraised like this, there's a, oat, a Little Debbie oatmeal cream pies flattened box down where the, the legs would be, but you feel like it's a kind of mannequin or impersonation of a human being lying down like this. The, uh, there's a note there as well on the middle, and I approached it with some trepid, trepidation. You know, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't consider myself to be the most privileged person in the world, but I felt that I was going to be rebuked for whoever I am by approaching this, this note. But actually, and you know, even in this very slide that I own, I cannot completely decipher the message, but it is not a rebuke. And in fact, it emphasizes a lot of qualities of goodness. And it says at the bottom, have a good day. And it's dated the same day we were there, June 15, 2017. So it's just been left. It's almost like a Robert Frost poem where the mower of the grass leaves um, a tuft of flowers. Why? For no reason except to leave it for the next person to see. So I'm thinking about all of this, and I'm thinking as we drive back about, well, I'm an art historian. And how does that relate? Because I teach at Stanford and also previously at Yale, I teach paintings like this. So this is. Raphael's Transfiguration from 1517 to 18, a huge painting at the Vatican that's 13 feet high, oil on wood, a tremendous presence. And you know, when I look at this slide here and right before you now, I think a little bit about um, you know, art was my refuge within the frames. I can escape from the volatility of my brother's world and to some extent my family's world. But there's something else about this, too. Um, when I teach paintings like this, they essentially are the same as that running stream in Chico for me. That is the experience I want to impart to my students. And you know, I'm 54 now. When I was like 35, you would have found me to be, uh, you know, not, not, not an un, not a, not a shallow person, but a kind of callow person, maybe, because I would have had a certain kind of skeptical attitude about something like this. And now I don't. And I don't impart that anything but a kind of belief to my students. And how so with this particular picture? And how is this going to relate to the story I've been telling you? Well, let me say this. This painting depicts um, actually two consecutive events in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. At the top, Jesus goes up on the mountain uh, with three of his apostles, um, James, Peter, and John, or John, Peter, and James. And the rest of the apostles are left down in the lower part of the picture. And something metaphysical happens. Um, uh, the Old Testament prophets, uh, Moses on the right and Elijah on the left, appear uh, as ghosts, basically. Uh, before Jesus, the apostles are uh, struck there up on the mountain. And then something even more spectacular happens, which is Jesus becomes kind of electrified and uh, transfigured in white light, and you hear the voice of God saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Um, Jesus 
after this, after the apostles up there look around, there's only Jesus there. And he says, what, what happens on the mountain stays on the mountain. Don't tell anyone about this. They come down. What's going on here? Well, this is Matthew chapter 17, uh, verses 14 through 20, um, where this man here is bringing in, kind of pushing in uh, his afflicted son who seems to suffer from seizures. And there's a great beseeching on the right side of the picture about help my son. The apostles on the left, the groundbound apostles in this dark terrestrial fear of, um, field down here are at sixes and sevens pointing this way, pointing that way about how to cure him. Jesus comes down, says, what's the problem? Um, and he instantly cures the boy. And the apostles basically say, what did we do wrong? And the answer is, they have not enough faith, ye of little faith. So one way to understand this picture is, um, you know, it's, it's too bad to be terrestrial beings like all of us, because we live in this confusion, this welter of pointing and trying to help and so on, but we're not able to do so. It's left to the gods and descendants of gods to be in this electrified atmosphere up above. But that's not how I see it. And that's actually not how one of my heroes, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the philosopher, saw it. Because first day in Rome, when Emerson was 30 years old, he went to uh, see this painting, March 28, 1833. First painting. Why? Um, Emerson would say, and I would say too, that we're not all compounded of uh, earthly material dust and dirt and kind of commensurate confusion that, in fact, there's a portion of us that is always lit up and light and transcendent. Emerson would call that, not surprisingly, the soul. So when I tell my students at Stanford um, that um, you know, this is almost a diagram of a human being, not just some human beings, but all human beings, that all of us have this kind of divinity within them, you know, I'm really referring to Emerson in particular. And some of the things he says in his essays, his, his important essays from the 1830s and 40s, make the connection between soulfulness and humanity very clear. He's, it has to happen in these moments. He says, in the woods, a man, so a person, casts off his years as the snake his slough. And at what period soever his life, no matter how old you are, is always a child. In the woods is perpetual youth. So like for Anna and I, within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign. That's the decorum and sanctity of calm. A perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, he says, my head bathed in the blithe air. And this is really where he's talking about Raphael, I think. Um, and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. That means like, just like the me first egotism, the mean, both kind of average, but also kind of cruel egotism that the world runs by, vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. And this is Emerson after he's resigned his position as a minister, and he's now writing in a kind of secular way as a philosopher, but he's searching for the divinity that doesn't exist for him alone, but for all of us. And he goes on in his Divinity School Address from 1838, so two years later, he's really talking about us being in the woods. And I don't care if it's me and Anna, it's really any one of you at any comparable moment of quiet in your life. He says, speak the truth and all nature and all spirits help you with unexpected furtherance. The bark on the trees, the leaves, etc., the rocks beneath the shimmering water are all your friends. They're aiding and abetting you. Speak the truth and all things alive or brute are vouchers. And I love this because I do feel this when I walk to school. And the very roots of the grass under, underground there do seem to stir and move to bear you witness. That's why I say to my students, um, why study the humanities? Well, 
If you notice, when you do that, the grass grows just a little sharper and clearer and straighter in your perception. All evil is so much death or non-entity, benevolence is absolute and real. That you feel the world is good, you have a kind of goodness within yourself. That naivete, if you want to call it that, is exactly what I go to the mat for. He goes on, Emerson, the perception of this law of laws awakens in the mind a sentiment which we call the religious sentiment and which makes, and I believe this, our highest happiness. Again, recurred to me and Anna by the stream. Wonderful is its power to charm and to command. It is a mountain air. It is the embalmer of the world, like it makes everything fragrant. It is myrrh and storax and chlorine and rosemary. It makes the sky and the hills sublime, and the silent song of the stars is it. When I teach 18-year-olds this, you know, um, it's, it's interesting because they don't know necessarily, like for all that he's saying, that's actually true. And that's one of the great rewards of teaching. Um, I try to connect with my students' um, naivete because I'm naive, and I believe that there's a kind of ethics to that that comes out of this, and I'm following Emerson. And he goes on to say, this sentiment is divine and deifying, so you do feel at these moments, and you've all had these experiences, that there's something that makes you more than just meat and bones and emails. It is the beatitude of man. It makes him illimitable. Through it, the soul knows itself. It corrects the capital mistake of the infant man, so the person who is not really woke enough, who seeks to be great by following the great and hopes to derive advantages from another by showing the fountain of all good to be in himself, actually. And that he, equally with, and this is a democratic America, 1830s, equally with every man, every person, is an inlet into the deeps of reason. When a person says, I ought, when love warms a person, when that person chooses, warned from on high, the good and the great deed, then deep melodies wander through his soul from supreme wisdom. Then he can worship, be enlarged by his worship, for he can never go behind this sentiment. You can never explain it or rationalize it away. It just simply is the sublimest flight, uh, flights of the soul. When um, you're in this mode, rectitude is never surmounted and love is never outgrown. So it's a kind of unconditional experience of um, belonging and of goodness in the world. So says Emerson, and it's available to anyone, and so I would think it is to this day. So I thought back to Emerson and Raphael and to the nameless person who left the portrayal of herself there for me and Anna to see, and I looked at the obviously the kind of Christian configuration of the sweatshirt, but I also saw that this sweatshirt is compounded of dirt and sun. It is weighed down with the rocks. It's left there. It's a kind of death effigy. It is what is mortal in us, but it's also lit up, too, and kind of dappled with a sunlight that no painter could paint, no writer could write, but simply is a kind of warmth in the world. This made me think about this idea of trespassing that I spoke of before, too. And what you're looking at on the screen is actually Maid Mary and Olivia de Havilland, except now, um, obviously, um, off-duty, um, hanging out in the year 1940, so just after the Robin Hood movie, with her then-boyfriend, Jimmy Stewart. And they're in the hills and above Santa Barbara, so I've heard from the photographer's son. This photograph was taken by one of... Jimmy Stewart's roommates in Brentwood, not Henry Fonda, who was one of the roommates, but another guy named John Swope. Hence, the two figures are relaxed in the presence of their friend. What I love about this photograph is there's no sense of trespassing at all. Like, these people are movie stars. They are, we might say, entitled, but I want to think of it more favorably. They're at ease and at peace with not only lying on the ground, but somehow being lifted off of it, the beautiful cloudiness of Olivia de Havilland's white sweater speaks to that kind of airiness. It's though in this picture with the sloping ground, the, the world is kind of um, revolving. They're like on the ball of the globe, going around and around. They're like gods. 
And yes, it's a time-bound world. It looks like the nifty portable phonograph has come to the end of the song. Uh, we can imagine the needle is squibbing at the internal circle of the record. And yes, Jimmy Stewart on his left hand is wearing um, a watch. Um, yes, time comes even for gods, but still it's this kind of weightlessness that I experience in this. And part of me wants to feel a little resentful. Well, movie stars get to be this way. Movie stars get to be light. Movie stars get to do hijinks, uh, as on this same uh, picnic where Jimmy Stewart is climbing up. And in the manner of all girlfriends uh, everywhere, Olivia de Havilland is wondering what exactly he's doing. Um, Eventually, she comes up too. She, when I wrote to her for permission to use uh, these photographs in a book I wrote a few years ago, she wrote back very lucidly at age 97 to say, yes, I give permission. I've never seen these photographs before. And then her only stipulation was that I should emphasize, so I do it right here. Uh, that was a very high school relationship. That was not the love of my life. Just make sure you note that, so i do it. But you know, a friendly high school relationship, yeah. So um, a beautiful picnic, uh, wonderful photographs. Olivia de Havilland, so devastatingly beautiful. Um, and a number of frames from, the, um, from that picnic, including some showing Jimmy Stewart um, bending down back, uh, butt, butt foremost to his friend, the photographer, as if to emphasize the ungainly uh, ungainliness of his long-legged uh, stoop there. Um, and, you know, I said resentment. Why is it that movie stars get to be the ones who don't feel that they're trespassing? But what it occurred to me is actually um, none of us have to feel like we're trespassing on the good here or when we have these kind of moments. Uh, all of us are astride the globe of the earth, and all of us have this kind of lightness within ourselves. That ether or ethereal nature of Jesus in Raphael's painting is basically, in my way of thinking, one and the same as the cloudy sweater that Olivia de Havilland wears. The rich and the poor, right? The grounded and heavy and defeated versus the people who have the means to be light and uplifted. So we could use this comparison as a strict schematic or diagram to just talk about haves and have-nots. But I would prefer to think that the figure on the left is all acknowledging to whoever happens to see it um, the power and capacity of anyone to be lifted up. And you know, it doesn't happen at expense of or by ignoring the rocky grounded, grave, gravity-bound, um, physical diminishing and impoverishment of this person, it's, it's still there. The light is still there. So I just came back to that note again, and I kept thinking about the note, now seen a little closer. You know, it says, to whomever it may concern, um, it talks about, um, you know, um, loving and laughing living, it closes with have a good day. Um, it signs off with a word that I rarely use in one of my lectures, which is the word toodles. Uh, <laughs> but I was nonetheless able to acknowledge that this was some kind of providential sign. And thinking about it further, I thought it's almost like Emerson himself wrote it. And you know why? Because here's something Emerson says, is that these moments of goodness are so evanescent they're, they're gone like the particular configuration of light and shade. But they're also indestructible. You know, they outweigh, outlive, outlast depravity, cruelty, and let's go down cynicism, skepticism, um, anger. He says these are the most indelible aspects of our lives. And this is the way he puts it, because he's going to acknowledge how rare these moments are. He says, there is a difference between one and another hour of life in their authority and subsequent effect. So if you're driving through the drive through at McDonald's, or you're ordering a pizza, or um, doing one kind of thing, it has one kind of effect. 
But then there are these other moments that seem to take on a different character. And this is what he says, our faith comes in moments, our vice is habitual. Yet, there is a depth in those brief moments which constrains us to ascribe more reality to them than to all other experiences. I believe that. Man, so a person, is a stream whose source is hidden. When I watch that flowing river, which out of regions I see not, like where do we come from? You know, where do I come from? I see not the regions I come from. Um, pours for a season, it streams into me. I see that I am a pensioner, meaning I'm a renter on life. Not a cause. I don't, like, zap from my fingers and make things happen. I'm a pensioner. I'm leasing from some larger force. Uh, I'm not a cause, but I'm a surprise spectator of this ethereal water, as I'm sure you felt in Aspen, that you're just kind of passively taking things in sometimes when you look at the mountain against the sky. That I desire and look up and put myself in the attitude of reception. Okay, world, I'm ready. Deliver me my shot of soul like the Allstate juice truck. Uh, but um, I'm in the attitude of reception, but it's from some alien energy that the visions come. You know, I, we have talked about humility at this conference with various people. And there's such an in, influx of strength that comes from the humility that he's talking about here. And what happens in these moments? You just experience the real. You experience the world as it actually is. And he says what you get is that overpowering reality which confutes, so confounds our tricks and talents, like all the kind of assemblage of skills and techniques and attitudes we have to kind of throw at the world and constrains everyone to pass for what he is, like who you are, and to speak from his character and not from his tongue, and whichever more tends to pass into our thought and hand, and become wisdom, and virtue, and power, and beauty. Only those things come from these moments. That's all that, that comes from it. Wisdom, virtue, power, and beauty from this calm. And he says about us, including me, certainly, how fallen we are. He says, we live in succession, in division, in parts and particles. That's just what the world is. That's part of being human. But meantime, within a person is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal uh, beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. So this forest scape there in Bidwell Park is just a smattering of leaves. It's a kind of jigsaw puzzle that is broken apart into a bewildering meaninglessness. There is no rhyme or reason to the world. It's just a bunch of kind of fragments that come together, sure, coalesce in the pond of our eye, but really there's nothing to it. But he's saying that's not really the case. If you look, look closely, and this deep power, the power of the eternal one in which we exist and whose beatitude is all accessible to us, so it's, again, it's a democratic thing, um, is not only self-sufficing and perfect in every hour, that is, the world is always making itself anew at every second, but the act of seeing and the thing seen, the seer and the spectacle, the subject and the object are one. So the calm of the oneness you see is the calm of the oneness within yourself. He says, we see the world, unfortunately, piece by piece, as the sun, the moon, the animal, the tree, but the whole of which these are the shining parts is the soul. And when you think about nowadays, I'll just say two critiques of this attitude are, one, there's no financial value in it. It is pointless. It can't be monetized. It can't be even utilized, really. It's ineffable. And then the other is, plainly speaking, it's not woke enough. You mean to tell me, I'm paraphrasing things I've heard, um, you know, with all the injustice in the world, with all the daily evidence of cruelty and depravity, that you're out looking at a stream? You know, what, what is your problem? And let me go one further. You're privileged. Only certain people have the, have the, the ability, the right, or the self-expectation to 
uh, go ahead and stare at a stream and then feel, as I'm talking about now, about how life and goodness flows from those things. You know, tell that to the person behind bars. Tell that to the indigent person. Tell it to anyone. And I guess I've learned to resist those kind of criticisms and just feel with Emerson that in an experience like this is, again, a kind of evanescent but indestructible kind of goodness that is a social and an ethical power. And it, it surmounts even a possibly simple biographical scenario, which might go, um, my brother was killed. I'm going to, like, by main strength, I'm going to like, refuse that darkness, and I'm going to look at this stream. But I don't, I don't experience it as a repression of darkness. Um, anyone who's heard my lectures <laughs> knows that I'm, I can deliver the darkness really well. I'm, uh, I'm just, um, I'd like to let a little more light in, not just for me, but for all of you. Thank you. And yes, we do have time for some questions. Um, and there are mi there's a microphone there. And um, there's, there's a question here uh, in the front, Samantha. Yeah. Oh, coming down here. OK. Just a fast comment. Thank you for resisting the criticism. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. As the beneficiary, John Debs from Palo Alto, of your many lectures, it's always a pleasure. What have you learned in Aspen with all these amazing people and the amazing scenery and the, the whole setting since I know you haven't been here before? Yes, yeah, so what have I learned in Aspen? I think, um, not surprisingly, I've enjoyed the quiet walks and, and also um, being educated um, by some of the sterling, thoughtful, people who in their own realms of life, which I think of as you know, more um, social and rational than my own, um, nonetheless walk the same path as me. Um, yeah. Great. I don't know how, for how long you've been teaching, but what? have you seen is the evolution of the Stanford students? What have you seen is your own evolution impacted by and yielding to the exchange with the students? Well, I have marvelous students at Stanford, um, really extraordinary, who are able to be there at the bank of the stream with me, absolutely, and who regard it as um, a tonic in just the way I do. And that's actually one proof I have for what I say is the, the, um, the look in my students' eyes. You can just see, you know, life itself is not limited to just being in one time and place as a, as a body, but we all have some other aspect of ourselves, some sky within ourselves, but here's my answer. Uh, Stanford is largely an entrepreneurial school. Stanford um, doesn't... Um, most of the students um, believe that there's no point to humanistic education, or if they do, they are constrained by limitations of the curriculum, namely vast numbers of unit that, units that are required by, for scientists. Um, they just can't take any art history classes or any class, maybe one or something like that. So that makes me something of a bad wrestler figure at Stanford. That's how I think I'm like the villain because I I like to go up there and just feel that um, I'm not going to accommodate. I have no, there are no learning outcomes on my syllabus. You have to put those at Stanford, but I don't. Uh, I don't know. I can't, I'm making you aware of some other aspect of existence. I'm using art as a way to get into that. Um, and just, I can only hope that more uh, students feel that way or are exposed to this way of thinking. Um, 
And that's, that's my response, yeah. Hi, I'm Alex Goldman. Uh, so obviously, we're very lucky in Aspen to be able to feel the oneness with nature like you described in all of Emerson's quotes. But for people who live in places where you, know, you can't really go into a beautiful stream or somewhere like that, like I live in New York City, like what are alternatives to kind of have that experience? I'm reminded of the photographer Walker Evans who made his great photographs in many of them in the 1930s and all, they're all urban. And uh, he was being taken in New Haven, Connecticut from one place to another. And as he was walking along, and this was reported to be by the person he was walking along with, he would see like a piece of garbage in the gutter. Like let's say it's like a crushed cup or a beer can. And he would go, that's my answer. You know, it doesn't, I, I don't, I mean, Emerson's talking about nature, but he's, it's a very social philosophy. Um, the, you know, the woman churning the buttermilk, you, know, um, ch you know, churning the butter, the uh, man reading the newspaper, tipping his chair back on the porch of the country hotel at a certain time of day. It's always that stream. And so the dichotomy between nature and like, oh, I'm, in this massively fallen world. I don't accept and I don't think he did either. Uh, thank you very much. This is so refreshing, I can't tell you. Your um, presentation was a wonderful example of introspection, taking us into an, yeah. um, an introverted quiet, thoughtful place, and it's such a wonderful counterpoint to the, the wild, uh, extroverted world that we live in today. Yes. Do you have any further thoughts on that? I think that lecturing should be essentially the person thinking to him or herself out loud in public in a way that is deeply mindful of an audience, and I'm always so respectful for people who come to my talks but it has, to be a pri it has to be thought ongoing in real time and real space. And the minute you pay excessive attention to an audience, I think you demean the audience as well as yourself by pandering and kind of somehow mediocritizing the audience by saying, well, how am I going to pitch this? Well, I ain't going to worry about that beyond just the sheer nuts and bolts of how to do this because, because of what I said. We're all souls. We all we all can be taken into ourselves and made to sit and, 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 and be in that introversion that we all share in common. So um, I can't, unfortunately, I can't be a mover and shaker. Uh, I just can't do it. You know. Stan, OK. Hi. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about the impact your dad had on your life, has had on your life. Yeah. And I was a student of his in, the uh, yeah. in 1970 in St. Louis. I, I don't know what became of him. Uh, yes, yeah, so my father was a, a professor at Washington University. He was a, also a poet. He was a poet laureate of the United States um, just before he died in 1991. And uh, yeah, I can, I feel like you know, there's a way that he can, um, I can ventriloquize him. Um, but as with all fathers and sons, it's complicated. <laughs> so people can often say, wow, I heard your dad's voice in, in your voice. And I say, yeah, per, per, per being at the place where something happened once upon a time, I do believe that we're compounded of both presence and absence. So my father is absent here, but he's present in his absence in me right now. And that's a glory as well as a, a complexity. Um, my, his sister was a photographer, Deanne Arbus, so her name was Deanne Nemirov. And um, I think about her, too. And one thing I always put is, you know, she killed herself when, she was, when I was eight years old, so I have no memories of her. And my father died when I was uh, 27, but since the, since they've died, I have a great conversation with them both, which I would just define as, um, you know what? 
they took art absolutely seriously and poetry. And what they meant by that, they, they came from the mid 20th century. And you know what that time was? That's a time when art, poetry, et cetera, was a kind of substitute religion. And you actually were trying to make contact with truth. And I love that legacy that comes through to me. Because otherwise, truly, why would I do this? There's no reason. Because the only alternative I can think of to being a teacher standing on this stage is to be an expert, a kind of information deliverer. Uh, forget it. So what I love most about my aunt and my father is the way they've given me this sense of like, there's no 50% on this. If you're going to make a picture, it better um, be transfigurative. It better knock people back. And um, that's, that's their connection to me. There's a question here. Um, I tried to buy your book at the book signing, and they were all out. I'm hoping that you'll tell us something about the book that you've recently written. So I just wrote a book called Summoning Pearl Harbor, which is just very simply, how do you go into the past that doesn't exist, except for, the, of course, the memorials and so on. But memorials are often meant to kill the past that they commemorate, you know, to kind of bury it. And how do you actually commune with a site of trauma and loss, for example, at Pearl Harbor, for which you know, all the lives lost, there's no particular evidence except names in stone. And it's a Quixote-like journey uh, that is a kind of sublimely foolish journey, as all of mine, I hope, are, where um, I'm really saying, like one of my favorite characters in Henry James, pointing to where something she sees, but no one else sees, pointing right to it, says, right there. Right there where nothing is. You see it? I do a lot of that, yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's a kind of religious attitude of that, but there's also, as in summoning, like I'm going to summon something up, but it's also a kind of necromancy, and it's also a kind of melancholy, and you know, because there is nothing there, finally. And again, to defeat the idea that it's just me with my attitudes and like, OK, that was him, I feel that all of us are compounded of the same kind of feelings. For example, just very simply about presence and absence. And we learn to alienate ourselves from those feelings because it's hard. They're, they're, they can be very volatile. But if you really wanted to know why you go to an art museum or why you read a poem, and you already know this, but I'm just reminding you, it's for the reason I just gave. OK, last question. Here in the front. Hello. Here comes the mic. <laughs> what was the reason you chose robbing from the rich to give to the poor as sort of the title of this uh, presentation? Yeah, I think it's because um, I let the topic come to me. We went to Chico, we were there with Robin Hood. I get this email, and it makes me think about equalities and inequalities, but notice I don't have an answer, a clue, a decision, a takeaway, a go-to point here. Um, am I the rich? Am I the poor? I think it's, it's more complicated than a simple dichotomy. My brother was a privileged person in many ways, but he, he was the poor. You know? So in terms of our social world now of like you know, rampant labeling and condemnation, like you all know. You know, it's just way more, uh, it's way darker and way, way more complicated than that. And um, everyone in this room is weighed down by rocks and everyone in this room is lit up. My brother was the same way. And I don't propose to know the answer to what I myself have said today. It's, for, it's a question. Thank you.